thanks everyone, as I said, for coming along uh, virtually tonight to join us. Um, it's wonderful. I know we've had a strong interest in this forum and I've been running quite a few of these online recently and they've been um, wonderful opportunities to hear about what's going on at the moment, but what the future of our country should be as well. Uh, for those of you who I haven't met either in person or virtually, I'm Kate Thwaites. I'm the federal member for Jagger Jagger, uh, and I'm really pleased tonight to be um, joined by Mark Butler, Labor's um, shadow health spokesperson, uh, to take us through what is going on in health. I'll begin by acknowledging that I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, as I said, and as I was saying there, um, you know, it has been a time where I think we have never been so conscious of our health system, so reliant on our health system and um, so aware of the work that people in our health system are doing on behalf of us. And, and while we've been incredibly thankful to all of those frontline workers, uh, we also know that our health system um, has been under strain. Uh, is under strain now, um, you know, particularly for us here in Victoria, we know that we still have a relatively high COVID caseload uh, and that is um, making things difficult for our hospitals and, as I said, for our healthcare workers who have been uh, working at the front line for two years now and, um, you know, the reports I've seen are, while they're still doing a fantastic job, those people are obviously tired. Uh, and we know that um, some of these issues in our health system are not just issues that are COVID related, they're issues that predate um, uh, COVID and go to how our health system set up, how it's funded uh, and what I want to talk to you about tonight and what I hope Mark will go through as well, what it should look like in the future to make it stronger, um, to make sure that Medicare is still the safety net that we all need uh, to um, when we need health services to make sure that our hospitals are as strong as they can be and that all the systems that sit around that that should be there um, to keep us strong, healthy and help us lead good lives are in place. So as I said, I'm really pleased to have Mark Butler join us tonight for this discussion. I'm sure many of you know Mark and know uh, what an insightful, uh, inspiring person he is and uh, the dedication and thoughtfulness he brings to this portfolio I think is really important for all of us and, and for the future of health in our country. Uh, we'll hear from Mark in just a minute. After Mark's finished speaking, we'll take questions. If you can put your questions in the Q&A box, please, uh, and I'll put them to Mark. Try and save the chat box for chat. It's a bit hard for me if you put questions in both of them, it's hard to look across both. So questions in the Q&A box, chat in the chat. Uh, but on that note, over to you, Mark, and thanks for joining us tonight. Well, thank you, Kate. I'm coming to you from uh, the lands of the Ghana people and pay my respects to the elders past and present. Um, for those who don't know, that's, that's the city of Adelaide, which has been um, incredibly fortunate through this pandemic. But uh, all of us have um, really had the people of Victoria and more recently the people of New South Wales and the ACT as well, very much in our hearts over the last couple of years. We know you have done it just so tough, uh, just been so tough over there. Uh, and, um, uh, and hopefully, my sense is uh, there's a there's there's light at the end of the tunnel. You feel you're um, coming out of the end. The, the lifting of restrictions over the last few days must just be a blessed relief to to all of you over there. And thank you for joining us on the eve of Melbourne Cup. Um, I'd forgotten until Kate reminded me this is this is a this is a pretty big couple of days for the people of Melbourne. So it's great to spend some time talking uh, with you and with Kate about health policy. Uh, I've just been so overjoyed to have Kate join us as a member of our caucus over the last little while. She had very big shoes to fill, obviously, with the legendary Jenny Macklin as her predecessor, who was just such a wonderful leader in policy. And Kate has taken up that challenge uh, wonderfully, both representing her local community. I've done a number of forums now with her in different policy areas, but also being uh, a really articulate, progressive uh, ambitious voice in caucus for the Labor Party to constantly strive to, to do better, to be more ambitious, um, to make Australia a better place. And so it's been a real pleasure working with you, Kate. I, um, I was uh, shifted into the health portfolio at the beginning of this year, and it's been a real pleasure to be back in a policy area that really I spent most of my adult life working with in one way or the other, certainly before I went into the parliament, particularly in the areas of 
mental health and in aged care. And then I had the joy of working for four years in the health portfolio with Kevin Rudd and then for three years with Julia Gillard as Prime Minister. For much of that time, I worked uh, under Nicola Roxon, who was, I think, the best health minister, certainly in the last 25 years that Australia has had a uh, person of Melbourne, as, as many of you would know as well, and someone who uh, did some, some things that were not just really uh, impressive, incredibly important things for Australia, but were genuinely world leading, like her taking the tobacco companies on around plain packaging and a range of other anti-smoking measures that were fought tooth and nail by the tobacco companies for many years, including in the, the global courts, uh, but have really changed things here in Australia and given a signal to other countries as to what they should do to deal with that incredibly difficult public health challenge. So it's great to be back in this area um, after spending six or seven years in the climate change portfolio. And it's obviously been difficult to think clearly about health policy in a way that's not affected by the fact that we're living through this once in a century pandemic. But I, I thought I'd try to give you a sense of my clearest impressions over the course of this year and the things as a Labor Party that we're most, um, most focused on as we lead into the next election campaign. The first thing I'll say is that although our health system has been under enormous pressure, and as Kate said, was frankly under pressure even before the pandemic, um, I'm still incredibly proud of the health system that we have here in Australia. We, we really do, bang for buck, have one of the best healthcare systems in the world. And as Labor Party people, Kate and I are particularly proud of that because all of the key pillars of what we take for granted as our healthcare system, whether it's the pharmaceutical benefits scheme that a Labor government introduced in 1948 in the wake of the war, whether it's Medicare, obviously something the Labor Party fought very hard for over three or four decades, or whether it's Commonwealth funding for public hospitals and aged care. These are all very proud Labor initiatives and, and they still stand the, the population in really good stead, I think. And we are served but by just an incredible health professional workforce, um, doctors, nurses, allied health professionals, pharmacists, who have been not just on the front line, but in many cases on the front of the front line over the last couple of years. And as Kate said, I know um, just how exhausted uh, those health professionals are and, and in some cases, understandably, frankly, traumatised by what they've had to deal with, uh, often putting their own health at risk and on the line, dealing with a community that is just in such distress as the community in Victoria and <clears throat> more recently New South Wales has been. So. When I say that there are things we should and could do better in health, that by no means should derogate from, I think, our sense of pride of having a great healthcare system in, in this country. <clears throat> but as Kate said, <clears throat> even before COVID arrived on our shores, people were telling us as local members uh, across the country, they were finding it harder to get in to see a GP. Uh, if they got into a GP, they were paying a lot more out of their own pocket. Now, for the first time in Medicare's history, <clears throat> the gap fee or what you pay out of your own pocket is now bigger than the fee that Medicare contributes to you seeing a GP. Uh, you on average will pay over $40 to go and see a GP. Medicare on average will, will kick in $38. Uh, that is a profound change to the, to the compact we had when we set up Medicare three or four decades ago. And it's a product of the fact that Medicare rebates were frozen for seven years by this government. So effectively, the country's GPs had a wage freeze while their costs continued to go up. And it's no surprise really, that they had to recoup those costs by making you pay more if you weren't able to get in to see a bulk bill doctor. People are paying more for their, med uh, for their medicines if they're not uh, concessional patients. So it's, it's harder for people to get the care where they need, when they need it. <clears throat> and if they are able to get that, people are often paying a lot more than they used to pay out of their own pocket. So that, that is probably the most striking impression I've got. General practice is in real crisis. We're having, <clears throat> we're having great trouble recruiting new GPs to the system. Um, medical graduates are now choosing general practice 
far less often than they used to. It used to be the case that more than half of medical graduates would go into being a GP or a family doctor. <clears throat> now it's as low as 15%, 1-5%, not 50, but 15% of medical graduates are going into general practice, which leaves us with a real crisis, I think, lying ahead of us. Um, we've also, I think, got a real challenge still with our mental health system. This, again, was something that was quite apparent before the pandemic. But I think what some people call the shadow pandemic, Pat McGorry has described it as this, um, is reflected right around the world, that this incredibly traumatic experience is, have, is having a very real impact on people's mental health and emotional and social wellbeing. And we're seeing that right through the age cohorts, including the clinicians tell me really worryingly um, in very big numbers for under 12 year olds and teenagers as well. So we've got a very big challenge ahead of us in mental health. Uh, I'm pleased to say that as someone who's been involved in mental health policy for over 25 years, Victoria is busy reclaiming its place as the nation's leader in mental health policy. The Andrews government's response to the Royal Commission into mental health is, I think, a real opportunity for the whole country, not just Victoria, but the whole country to have a big rethink about how we treat Australians and support Australians who are dealing with mental health issues. And the last, last thing I'd say, um, or maybe the second to last thing I'll say very quickly, is um, one of the very deep impressions I've got uh, coming back into the, the portfolio is the depth of the crisis in aged care. Uh, and at the heart of it, that is essentially a workforce issue. Um, surprisingly, the government, which, which allocated a lot of money in this year's budget to aged care after the Royal Commission and after a lot of budget cuts um, several years ago, uh, they didn't really deal with the workforce challenges. We need to put nurses back into nursing homes. The idea that, that nurses aren't on shift 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year in a nursing home seems to me to be unsustainable. We need more well-trained care workers in, in the nursing homes as well to make sure that people are able to get the support that they need in a, in a care sense, in a health sense, but just in terms of human interaction, having those conversations, um, re receiving that sort of social response that we need from that system as well. That is very much going to be a focus of Labor's at the next election. So I might leave it there, Kate, just as a few words, or probably a little bit more than a few words of introduction. Thanks again for being a part of this forum, and I really look forward to the gentle probing questions that, that uh, we from Adelaide expect from you from Melbourne. Thanks, Mark, and I should tell the audience that the reason Mark has ended on that note was the last time he visited Jagger Jagger was in person and it was in his climate change portfolio and he did get some tough questions. So if you have tough questions for Mark, you can put them in the Q&A box and it's what he expects from Jagger Jagger. Um, but we do have some questions to start with, Mark, and, and Stephen has asked, um, if Labor wins the election next year, would you consider setting up a Royal Commission into the nation's response to the pandemic, looking at the quarantine setups, the development and distribution of vaccines, border closures, uh, and the training, remuneration and structure within the health system of our health workers? Well, thanks, Stephen. We, we haven't made um, a formal decision about, about what what sort of inquiry should, should take place. Um, but it would be, I think, highly unusual given, given the depth of this crisis and the breadth of it, how long it went on for as well, for there not to be um, a very, very thorough inquiry, potentially with, with the powers of a Royal Commission into all of those things that you've identified and more. Uh, and it's not about finding scapegoats. It's, it's frankly about learning from what we did well and what we didn't do well. And frankly, there's a lot about Australia's response that falls into both of those categories. 2020 saw um, us as a country perform as well as any country on the planet. Uh, you know, and Victoria was put under extraordinary pressure with that second wave, but still got those case numbers down to a zero where no other country in a comparable position was able to do that. So there's lots that we can learn about what we did well. We didn't follow up well, though, in 2021 with a vaccine rollout that, frankly, was the slowest in the developed world. So, so we want to make sure that there's a good record of what happened. Um, we learn from it. 
because this sort of thing is, is going to happen again. We know that from all of the good public health advice around the world, um, overpopulation, climate change, a whole range of things are, are going to drive these things more often, not less often. So we haven't made a decision about whether it will be a Royal Commission or something else, uh, but I certainly um, would take the view that it would be extraordinary after a crisis of, of this magnitude for there not to be a very, very thorough, objective, high-ranking inquiry into what went on. Mm -hmm. um, Mark, Don has asked, or starts with a comment really, I'm forever amazed at the amount of money, real money, that's wasted on things like advertising in the private health insurance industry. Uh, could a future Labor government unscramble this egg or what can be done to channel medical dollars into the health system where they belong? Uh, you're right to describe it, John, as a, as a scrambled egg. Um, now, we, when we put in place uh, Medicare, it was with the understanding that, that we would have a mixed system, a mixed health system with, with um, you know, underpinned by a strong public health system in primary care through Medicare and, and in the hospitals, but that there would be a private element to it, obviously in the public provision of services through your private GPs and specialists, but also with a private health insurance element. And, and that mixed, mixed system, provided that it's underpinned by universality, so everyone having the right to, to, to get health care, good quality health care, no matter um, the nature of their credit card, uh, I think that is still the right mix. But there is understandable concern out there in the community about whether people are still getting a good deal out of private health insurance. Uh, and, um, you know, that reflects uh, a lot of change about, about the sorts of market, sort of market that private health insurers are operating in. Um, their costs, you know, there are, there, and frankly, there's, there's a real level of variety among insurers. Some are not-for-profit insurers, who put plow all of their money back into healthcare. Others earn extraordinary profits, much bigger than you see in the banking system and in mining and so on as well. So, so sort of having a having a single response to this is difficult because we do need a sustainable private health insurance system in uh, in the country. Not every insurer is the same. Uh, so I think we want to take our time to to, if we do win the next election, to sort of step through the issues that are facing um, mainly consumers in, uh, in private health insurance, but doctors and other clinicians talk to us about the operation of private health insurers as well. I mean, is it right that insurers should also be delivering services or do you end up in the same potential conflicts that we saw play out in the Banking Royal Commission? These are all things that, that we would want to work through in the government. I think a real litmus test, though, for insurers as we lead into the election is um, because of the shutdown of elective surgery that happened over the course of the pandemic, private health insurers didn't pay out uh, what they expected to pay out. So there was a bit of a windfall. They were still charging all of you your, your usual health insurance premiums. Uh, and so what are they doing with that money? Uh, you know, how many of them are paying all of that money back to their members? Uh, you know, I think there are some, some important litmus tests for health insurers to, uh, to, to perform against, frankly, as we think through uh, what our response to that part of the health sector might be in, in the next election and afterwards. Mark, the follow-up question to that, I think, comes from Ken, who's asked a similar question around... Uh, you know, does Labor still think there's room for a private and Medicare system, but also uh, a specific question around uh, the premiums. Is Labor still committed to supporting the private healthcare system with the 30% of premium rebate for private health insurance? Well, um, well, thank you for the question, Ken. I think I sort of made some responses to that. In terms of the, the rebate, um, the rebate's no longer 30%. Uh, because it's essentially been frozen. So it's, it's being eaten away, if you like, by inflation, something the health insurance companies complain about a lot. They want it to be lifted back up to 30%, which we've got no plans to do. And you remember as well, maybe, Ken, that when we were in government, we means tested it as well so that, so that um, the rebate, more of the rebate would be provided to people on, on low and middle incomes rather than people who, frankly, could afford, uh, because of their income, to pay 
uh, all of their insurance. So we don't have any plans right now to change the private health insurance rebate scheme. Um, you know, we think we made a number of changes to make to make that fairer. Uh, youth mental health, Mark, which you already touched on a little bit in your intro, but um, a question from one of our students at La Trobe. Uh, Youth mental health is a big concern coming out of COVID. I was wondering if Labor is still focusing on rolling out new headspace services or if the focus has shifted to other ways to reach young people in need. Well, thanks for that, for that question. Um, this was this, um, you know, when I first got the mental health portfolio over a decade ago, uh, there was a building concern about youth mental health in the community. There, there really was. And up until that point in time, um, we would basically expected teenagers uh, and very young adults, but mainly teenagers who might be experiencing mental health issues to go and talk to mum and dad's GP about it. And unsurprisingly, not many did. Uh, um, you know, young, young men, teenage boys, uh, probably only about six or 7% of them who, who were experiencing mental health issues actually sought treatment. The rest just tried to deal with it by themselves. And what we realised, given that the vast bulk of mental health issues, unlike any other major condition, the vast bulk of mental health issues emerge when you're a teenager. You know, it's not like any other major disease like you know, heart disease, chronic disease, diabetes or anything. Uh, if you're going to get mental illness in your life, the chances are you'll get it before you're 21, about two thirds, and about three quarters before you're 25. So what we decided is we've got to build health services that young people feel comfortable using. Headspace is probably the most prominent of that, um, you know, publicly recognised, and it, I think it's been a great service. Uh, but it's not the only one. Um, you know, we, we also made sure we built uh, a lot of on online services around that. Partly that's because, um, you know, the tyranny of distance, if you're in an area that doesn't have a Headspace service, if you're in the country, or if you don't feel comfortable going to a face-to-face -face service and you just want to sort of sort of feel your way through an online service, that can be very effective. But we know clinically as well, online mental health supports can be highly effective supports. Provided there's an opportunity to move into face-to-face -face if you need it, online can be highly effective. The other thing we've tried to build though as well uh, was services for young people. I mean, Headspace is really designed for... Um, for, for young people who are experiencing, a, you know, up to a moderate level of, you know, mental health issues. And that's not to trivialise it, they're important issues. Uh, but up to a moderate level, often of anxiety or depression, uh, conditions like that, uh, there is obviously another group who will experience much more severe mental illness than that. They might, you know, move into a psychotic disorder. We've got to build services for those people as well, that might require some hospitalisation, um, but but again, in a youth friendly way. So so we funded some of those services, and I think we need to expand them as well. Talking to people like Pat McGorry and others who've worked in this area for a long time, uh, they're very successful where you can get hold of them, but there's probably not enough of them around the country still. Uh, I, I, I'm really keen to make sure that we're constantly thinking about new ways to deliver support. Um, just because, you know, when we were in government 10 years ago, we created a massive number of Headspace services and online e-Headspace and a range of other online services as well. It doesn't mean that that's now the right way to go. You know, we want to build on what really works, but also find new ways to innovate and particularly respond to to what young people think works as well. That's a really good point, Mark, that it's got to be um, what young people are also interested in rather than just um, what policy experts think needs to be there as well. Uh, Gary has a question around funding levels. Um, and Gary says, we know the health system can realistically receive higher levels of funding. Uh, is the ALP willing to argue for higher taxes to pay for services that the population may want? And are voters willing to pay for a higher level of services? Uh, and would the ALP campaign about that? Well, Gary, that's that's uh, that's the sort of question I expect from from Jagger Jagger. <laughs> um, that's that's uh, there's a lot in that. Um, well, can I say I think first of all. Uh, 
uh, right through my political career, which has been a relatively long one, um, Australians in research surveys have generally said, we value a world-class healthcare system as much as we value anything in this country. You know, it's one of, it's, if not the most important thing for people, it's, it's right up there in the top one or two or three usually. And, and they, they generally respond very well to the idea, uh, which is sort of pretty self-evident. You've got to pay for that. Like, you know, it just doesn't fall out of the sky. And if you try to nickel and dime, forgive the American expression, but if you try to nickel and dime your healthcare sector, you'll end up with pretty poor outcomes. And um, so I think, I think that's always been our approach uh, to healthcare, uh, you know, when we introduced the Medicare levy and a whole, bu whole bunch of the NDIS uh, funding scheme that we put in place, which is not strictly healthcare, but, you know, that social policy that we, we put faith in the willingness of Australians to put their hand in their own pocket to pay for a social support for their community, one that they might not use at all in the case of NDIS or use much, at least in the case of Medicare but one which they understood goes to the heart of what it means to be a decent society. And, and so I think that's been our approach to things. As to what we're going to do at the next election around taxes, well, that's not, you know, we've made a number of announcements about that. That's not my portfolio uh, responsibility, taxation. Uh, what we will be doing, though, is making sure that healthcare and aged care, particularly both of them, are uh, very, very prominent issues at the, the next election. And, um, you know, I think, I think people, people after many decades of our track record on that, I think people generally uh, understand that, that when we say that, we mean it in these areas. When we get into government, uh, there is always a very big step up in the, in the quality of healthcare services and re really serious reform that is often difficult, is often contested and resisted by some interests in society. Uh, but, you know, we... We want to win elections to in order to to do something. You know, we don't, not just for the sake of it, but to do something. And right near the top of our list, uh, if not at the top of our list, is making sure that Australia's healthcare system remains uh, one of the best in the world. Thanks, Mark. Uh, question from I think it might be Paul around the PBS. Uh, Paul says, we're keen to understand what's happening with the current PBS and the removal of nominated medicine. I have no more info on that. Sorry, Mark. So if you don't know what it's about, I can't give further information. Paul, if you want to put anything further on that question in the um, Q&A box, we can come back to it. Would that be useful, Mark, if we leave it for a minute and Paul maybe? Yeah, that would be, that would be good. That would be good. Um, you know, there's a lot of movement in the medicine sector at the moment. There, there are more reviews than you can poke a stick at, really, and some, some more still promised for the next couple of years, some of, some of which I think are well overdue. I think our medicine system is not really keeping pace. It served us very well for decades, but it's not really keeping pace with the, the um, speed of, of innovation in medicines. Um, so, uh, so I'm sorry, I, I can't really answer that question off the top of my head. If you put some more detail in the chat, I'll, I'll give it another go. Otherwise, um, through Kate's office, I'd be happy to have a question sent, an email sent through to her and we can provide a response offline. Thanks, Mark. A couple of questions that I will um, theme up now around dental. Uh, so Don's keen to know whether Labor's got any plans to include dental under Medicare. Uh, and then uh, we have another comment from someone who's anonymous online saying that um, workers are not paying the high cost of health insurance and they're instead preferring to use the public system. And that means that pensioners and others who need it miss out. How can this best be rectified? Uh, and then many pensioners are not able to get the treatment they need, even if it's urgent. And this person's currently been told there's a five year wait uh, for dentistry by Banyul Community Health, which I know, Mark, you visited with me earlier this year here in Jagger Jagger. And um, Banyul Community Health has told this person they have no funding for dentistry. So if we could do some dental there, Mark. Okay, okay. Um, as, people, as people probably know, den dental care was not included in Medicare uh, when, when it was first formed. 
Uh, and towards the end of his time in government, Keating, um, Keating sort of wanted to start to have a discussion about including dental within Medicare, which would have been a very big change, um, but, but didn't get the opportunity to do that, uh, having, losing government in 96. And, and John Howard certainly had no plans um, to, to do that. I mean, frankly, getting Howard to accept Medicare at all was, was something of an achievement. He certainly wasn't about to go and expand it. I think, every, I think everyone um, understands, first of all, the, the real challenges people have in getting access to dental care if they don't have private health insurance and um, how inextricably linked good oral health is with good general health. Um, so I think we, I think we all, all understand that. And it is sort of one of those accidents of history, I think, that, that, Medi that Medicare covers sort of your entire body except, I don't know whether people can see me doing this, but this, this, this bit um, called your mouth. Uh, you know, and we've had, we've had other goes, obviously, at, at, at trying to breach that, that long-standing wall, um, you know, Tanya Plibersek, uh, when we were last in government, introduced the Childhood Dental Benefits Scheme, which I think has been really, really important in terms of improving levels of childhood dental health, which we know is important for, the, for their entire life uh, and um, has led to the reactivation of school dental programs, much of which is funded now by the Commonwealth and such like. But that's really about looking to the future. It, it hasn't fixed. It hasn't fixed the sort of problem that that people have um, if they don't have private health insurance. With with the state dental programs largely being run down over the last many many years. Uh, so we took to the last election um, another dental policy which we weren't able to implement because unfortunately we lost the election, which was essentially to 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 replicate what we do for children. For, for pensioners. Um, and you know, that was a big part of, of Bill's, Bill Shorten's platform at the, at the last election. Now we have in our platform as the Labor Party, which is the, the document that, that sets out the Labor Party's mission, if you like, that's decided at our national conference every three years. Uh, we've got a commitment to, to continue to work at dental care becoming you know, brought into the, the idea of universality rather than just dependent upon either having private health insurance or being able to access state dental programs, which have really, frankly, been run down for 20 years. Um, whether, you know, what we'll say about that between now and the election, I can't tell you tonight. Uh, but, um, you know, this is obviously something that Labor has been trying to make inroads on now for many, many years, and we don't plan to give up. That is excellent to hear, Mark, and it is something that I'm sure you, like me, hear from a lot of people in the community that dental care is too hard to access and too expensive. Um, Gary uh, comments that uh, we're hearing a lot at the moment about funding being channeled towards fighting COVID, but there are other serious diseases and illnesses. How would a future Labor government improve access to safe, affordable, quality cancer care? Well, one of the um, one of the really disturbing things that I've read over the last couple of weeks, and you get to read lots of disturbing things in this portfolio in the middle of a pandemic. But one of the most disturbing things was the report from Cancer Australia that that um, set out the that just just how steeply um, cancer screening had fallen over the, over twenty twenty one and twenty twenty, and and although there's some drop off in the COVID free, relatively COVID free jurisdictions like South Australia, where I am and, and others, um, the really big drop off is obvious, for obvious reasons in uh, Victoria and to a degree in New South Wales as well. And, uh, you know, breast screen has been closed in places. Um, melanoma screening was down by 14% from, from memory. Um, you know, a whole bunch of other very common, incredibly important procedures have, have, um, have been put way behind schedule. And we're seeing this all around the world. Um, and so uh, a real challenge for, for government next year, what, whatever political colour that government has, is going to be how to deal with that backlog. Um, you know, we can't see that baked into the system forever. You know, if everyone goes for their regular breast screen appointment 
next year that they were due to have this year. We can't just have next year's appointments pushed back to the year after and so on and so forth. So thinking through that, I think, is a real challenge. There's going to be a huge um, catch-up required in elective surgery. I hate that term, elective surgery. It, it makes it sound as if this is, you know, this is just a bit of a nip and tuck for cosmetic reasons. I mean, you all understand the definition of it. It, it is any surgery that is not required within 24 hours. So it's basically anything that's not a really, really big emergency. And you all understand you're either, you've unfortunately experienced it yourself or know people who have, um, whose lives are, are seriously impacted by their inability to get something done um, through elective surgery. So this I think is a real challenge for the country next year. And talking to colleagues in places like the UK, which are, ahead of us in terms of the sort of COVID curve. Um, I've opened up earlier and so on and so forth. They're, they're, they're trying to deal with these backlogs, and theirs are even worse than ours, with a workforce that is exhausted. And they're seeing a big exodus of a lot of people who are maybe close to retirement, who held out and held out because that's what they do, because they work with a sense of purpose and mission. But at the end of it, they, they just found themselves unable to continue. So we, there is going to be a real challenge to pick up the pieces next year, even if we do continue to see COVID really sort of start to drop off through 20, the rest of 21 and, and into 22. There's a whole bunch of other health challenges that, that are coming down uh, the, the pipeline. And I know and I've talked about screening and cancer, and you asked me about that in particular, I know mental health impacts of this pandemic are, are gonna have a very long tail as well. They will last for a considerable period of time. That was our experience when we were trying to put mental health supports in place after the Black, the Black Saturday fires in Victoria. Uh, that tail lasted for four years. So we have a, we have a real challenge next year. Um, as to your sort of longer term, question, Gary. I think, I think what we're going to, we'll have more to say, obviously, between now and the election about these policies. Uh, but I, I think what we're going to have to do is focus um, in the very short term as well. We, we, we're going to have to work out how we make sure that the, the backlog that was created, understandably, in many cases, because, because of COVID, does not bake in some very, very poor health outcomes. Because if, it's, if they're not addressed with a sense of urgency, um, then that is what will happen. Yeah. Uh, Mick has some questions around um, mental health, Mark. Um, so there's a few parts to this, these questions. Um, would Labor be willing to establish a specialist mental health nurse register with APRA? Uh, is Labor willing to implement the Productivity Commission recommendations for mental health and uh, would Labor be willing to commit to a National Mental Health Act uh, that would define the underpinnings for state and territory mental health acts? They are great questions. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I haven't thought through the Mental Health Nurse Register with, uh, with APRA, Mick. So if, uh, if you do have some material about that, can I ask you to send it through to Kate's office to pass to me? Uh, I'm really excited by the, by the idea at a conceptual level. Um, I'd want to read through it, obviously. I think mental health nurses um, have an extraordinary amount to contribute to, um, to our healthcare system, not just in specific mental health settings, but, but in broader primary care settings as well. Um, uh, I, um, I was actually got, I got my sort of first job employed by uh, a mental uh, health nurse um, called John Gillard, who was Julia's dad uh, uh, about 30 years ago. Um, he was a very active career mental health nurse, what we used to call psych nurses back then, psychiatric nurses, uh, and um, learned, learned a lot about mental health, as I know did Julia, much more than me, from, from her dad and, and uh, his colleagues. And I know how, how important they can be um, in triaging and coordinating care in some really exciting, I saw them work in headspaces, for example, 
in incredibly effective ways. So um, please send that through. I'd be very keen to consider that. I don't have a definitive answer for you because the question's never been put to me, Mick. One of the great, well, two great things came out of the Victorian Royal Commission. The first was the fact the government accepted all the recommendations and found substantial funds to implement them. The second thing, though, was um, that the Feds and Victoria started to negotiate an agreement between them that I think will be the, the model for the whole country about finally who does what, like what is the Commonwealth's role here? And, and I think, you know, what, what I've said in my discussions with, with uh, people in mental health, whether they're con consumer groups or, or clinicians and all of the NGOs who work in the area, is, you know, we don't know when, when we get to the next election what the status of that agreement is going to be. That's essentially something being negotiated between Premier Andrews and, and the Commonwealth. Um, uh, which of the Productivity Commission recommendations will be ticked off by then? And the mental health sector uh, has broadly said, look, but we think we need to see this stuff play out before we decide you know, what next? So I'm talking with them very regularly, obviously, about what they want, all the different groups want us to take to the next election. Um, uh, and in part, that will depend upon whether the Commonwealth and, and the states finalise this agreement, which is supposed to be finalised by the end of this month, so well before the next election. That may, that may involve consideration of the Mental Health Act uh, at a at a federal level to pick up one of your questions, Mick. I've got a pretty open mind about, about that. I think the more um, uh, everyone can be clear what the Commonwealth's role is, and maybe that does take legislation, then the better. Because frankly, what we find in the mental health system is that, that too many people are confused about who's supposed to be doing what. Okay. And I apologise for my broadband. <laughs> Yes, we all have MBN issues, unfortunately. Um, Mark, a, a broader question from Jane, um, but an important question. Is the Labor Party committed to working on the social determinants of health to have real effects on better health for all Australians? Uh, I hope absolutely. Yes. Uh, I, I, I could just say yes. Um, um, but uh, absolutely, and some of the really exciting work, I mean, I'm very lucky to be in Adelaide for a range of reasons, so I think it's a great city, but, but we, have, we have some of the really great thinkers on social determinants of health up at Flinders University, uh, Fran Baum and others who, are, who I work with and have for, for many, many years thinking through this. Uh, probably the only note of caution um, I, I'm, I sort of give about, about that is that um, I... You know, we, we, have, we have a universal entitlement to healthcare here in Australia, and that's a great thing. Um, but that doesn't mean we've got universal access. So, so even, even though everyone's entitled to go and see a GP and have Medicare pay for it, or a psychologist in certain circumstances and so on and so forth, um, actually getting one is a very different question depending on whether you live in Turak or you live in an outer suburb of one of the major cities or in a regional town, let alone in remote Australia. So, so um, you know, I think the social determinants is sort of a bit further down the spectrum than that. There's just simply the equality of access, I think, that we also try to focus very heavily on in the Labor Party, and you, you wouldn't be surprised about that given our philosophy. Um, and then behind that in itself is hard enough, even without thinking about about social determinants, just, just implementing that philosophy of universality hasn't worked in Australia. You know, we, there are still too many people in outer suburbs and in, and in our regions can't get access to the healthcare that, that we take for granted in, say, in some of the very inner suburban areas. Um, so let's fix that as well and, and as well understand that, that uh, social determinants are such a huge driver. Of, of health outcome. Um, you know, we know that, we know that very well. And um, uh, we should constantly be thinking about how to implement that in policy. And that sort of probably brings the broader question up about health promotion and prevention. Um, that's some, some extraordinary work that Nicola Roxon did in our, in our time in government 
much of which was undone by Tony Abbott, frankly, not for any reason other than Labor did it. Uh, and I think you know, there's much more we could do that is targeted to particular populations uh, where, where we know good health promotion programs like quit smoking programs and so on and so forth can, can really set people up for much better health outcomes. Mm, absolutely. Uh, going back to the PBS, and, and Paul has put a bit more information in, uh, in here, which is really that is concerned um, by reports and hearing um, that medication is coming off the PBS. So I guess, you know, when you hear those yeah. stories about such and such, yeah. is about come off the PBS and what the implications of that are. Yeah. Um, again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure particularly what, what, you're, what you're focused on there, Paul, but we are seeing some medicines taken off the PBS. Um, and, and getting to the bottom of, of that is something that, that we have a parliamentary inquiry into right now, which, is, which has been, I think, the most successful parliamentary inquiry I've seen in the House of Representatives. The Senate does really good inquiries all the time. It's not as common in the House of Representatives. Uh, but this, this inquiry into access to medicines and other medical technologies has been going for most of the year. It's expected to report soon. It's been really bipartisan. It's been chaired, co-chaired by Mike Freelander for Labor, who is a, a paediatrician, former pa well, still a paediatrician from, from Western Sydney, and Trent Zimmerman, who's a Liberal Party uh, member from Sydney as well. They've worked really well together, a lot of mutual respect, really engaged a lot of groups into thinking through these issues. And I think we'll have a better idea what's going on after we get that report. But one of the things I know that, that, is, that is driving some of this is, um, is sort of global as well. I mean, I've seen reports of medicines being taken off the PBS because, um, because America, under frankly, the Republicans and the Democrats are introducing a, a type of pricing uh, system that, that, that is called international reference pricing. And it looks at what the price in Australia is, uh, among other countries, looks at Japan, looks at a whole bunch of UK and European countries. And it, it then works out, well, this medicine sells for however much in Australia and this much in the UK. They average that out and say, well, you can only sell the medicine for that much in the US. And the medicines companies just are horrified because they sell their medicines for a lot more in the US. So there is, there is, uh, or it's already clear that some pharmaceutical companies are dropping, uh, are withdrawing medicines from the Australian system because our prices are too low. And, and given how small the Australian market is, they don't want um, the Australian price to impact a market as big as the US. China is also introducing a similar system of what they call international reference pricing. And, and that, that may well have an impact on the availability of medicines here in Australia as well. So we're, we're trying to work through that. Uh, if there are other reasons why you think medicines are being taken off the PBS that we should be uh, concerned about and looking at, uh, Paul, please send a note through to Kate's office and she'll pass them on to me. Thanks, Mark. Um, we have 10 minutes left and just four questions, so I think we should be able to power through this. Um, Sean has asked, uh, she has a federally accredited master's degree in counselling and psychotherapy, but despite a lot of advocacy and lobbying from professional bodies, the ACA and PACFA, uh, cannot get a provider number and be part of the Medicare system. Uh, is there something Labor would do about this? Um, Sean, Sean, you're right. This, is, this has been hotly contested for, for some time <coughs> now. Um, what Sean is talking about <clears throat> for people who aren't across the details of this is that you can, you can get a Medicare rebate for a counselling session with certain professionals, um, so social workers, OTs and, and registered and clinical psychologists, but, but not, not necessarily some other health professionals who have you know, very substantial, in Sean's case, postgraduate qualifications in counselling. Uh, we don't we don't have a position <clears throat> developed yet to take to the next election. Um, over many years, I've I've tried to continue to engage with those groups about about um, you know who should have access to 
to uh, Medicare rebates for their for their patients. I haven't I haven't had that conversation over the course of this year. Uh, really, probably because it's been very hard to meet with organisations like that. Chance, I'd be certainly happy to have another meeting. Again, it's an issue that I'm quite familiar with over many, many years, but probably need a bit, bit of updating on. Um, so if you are involved in, in one of those associations and want to send them my way, please, please feel free to do so. Thank you, Mark. Um, Jean had a, another question uh, around healthcare for Aboriginal people and um, the poor outcomes in that space and um, what Labor might do in, in, for healthcare for Aboriginal people. Thanks, thanks, Jean. Um, I mean, this is <clears throat> this is really one of the, the one of the most significant, if not the most significant, stains on an otherwise wonderful healthcare system we have here. And, Unfortunately, it's not particular just to health, but the health outcomes of our First Nations people are uh, just appalling, and there's no other word for it. Life expectancy, any other major indicator you choose to, to think about, um, Indigenous Australians perform so much worse on average than, than um, the, the, the national average. You know, I think there are areas where when Kevin Rudd um, first developed the Closing the Gap uh, program, which had substantial funds allocated to it. Uh, I have to say, so substantial amounts of which were cut by Abbott in his first budget in 2014. Since then, there are some areas where I think we've made good progress um, and far too many areas where we haven't made progress. So some of the infant mortality indicators, for example, I think we've done pretty uh, well on, still a long way to go, but done pretty well on with some highly focused mums and bubs programs and, um, and screening and, and programs to improve the health of expectant mothers and such like, I think have done well. These things show that just with, with investment that is community led, that's the message, that's the lesson we've learned so much, that is community led, designed uh, and delivered by community controlled health organisations, Aboriginal community controlled health organisations, you can get um, outcomes that are that are that are um, you know as good as other outcomes in the country. So uh, we're still working now through what we might take to the next election on Indigenous health. As you probably know, since we were last in government, uh, we've we've really grown our First Nations caucus. It's it's such an exciting caucus led by Linda Burning as our Shadow Minister for Indigenous Affairs, but but with Pat Dodson in it, Melandiri McCarthy. Um, uh, you know, Marion Swimshaw, we hope, is going to join us from the Northern Territory, who was a minister in the Northern Territory government. So there's some great thinking there. I'm, I'm working with them now with our First Nations caucus and others about our Indigenous health policy. But this, this, will, um, this is really important national business and, and it will be a, a big part of Labor's healthcare policy. If you have any suggestions, and what, sorry to continue to do this, Kate, but if you have any suggestions you'd like to send through to me as we're thinking about that, please um, email them to Kate and she'll forward them to me. No, absolutely. And please don't be sorry, Mark. I'm always really happy to hear from people, um, including, of course, about health and health needs. So if there are things that are coming up that you haven't got to ask or that I haven't quite got your question right um, and you want some more info, please do email through and we will follow up with Mark. So last question, Mark, um, and this is from Ken, who says the Pharmacy Guild is again lobbying to protect pharmacy services, uh, brackets for a comment, the last remaining monopoly in Australia where it comes to protecting their business location services, etc. And they're again opposing more retail online services. Does Labor support opening up the Guild's monopoly? We don't have any plans. We don't have any plans to to change the the rules that are set out in the current community pharmacy agreement. I think it's called. Um, these are these are agreements negotiated with, between government and, in this case, the community pharmacy sector. They last for five years. Um, I've always had the view that 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 unless there's something utterly outrageous, then then you know certainty requires incoming governments to adhere to or respect an agreement with their government that the Australian government has entered into after good faith negotiations. There's one that's just been struck with the medicines industry as well. 
<clears throat> so, you know, by and large, we will generally see ourselves as by, bound by those. And that agreement includes the location rules, as you'd understand, Ken. Um, and there is, I mean, I only read this morning, the AMA is keen to uh, start to break into what, what's traditionally the pharmacy role of providing medicines. The pharmacists are wanting to provide more medical services in their community pharmacies, which is which is usually met with resistance from the AMA and other, other doctors groups. So look, this is, um, health is still a sector that, that has levels of what I would, you know, in my old union days have called demarcation that, that you don't see in many sectors of the economy or society anymore. They are highly contested. Um, and uh, let, me, let me maybe just say this to close because it's sort of impacted by this. We have a great health workforce in this country, um, some of the best trained in the world, but we don't use them enough. Uh, at a time where demand for healthcare is sort of going through the roof and will continue to go through the roof even after COVID, uh, just because of the growing incidence of chronic disease and the ageing of the population. And, and workforce supply challenges. If we've got demand going up and supply sort of flat or going down in some areas, it doesn't make sense not to have every healthcare professional operating to the top of their scope of practice. So that is using every skill that they've been trained to, to use. Uh, and at the moment, we have a whole lot of rules in health that don't allow bunches of different healthcare professionals to use their full training uh, or to operate to the top of their scope of practice. Nurses and pharmacists, many, many allied health professionals uh, are, are the most obvious examples of that. And to me, it just doesn't make sense. Um, those, those people train in the expectation that they're going to be able to utilise all the skills that they've acquired. But, but we as taxpayers all put a lot of public money into training the hundreds of thousands of healthcare professionals we have and we should get the best possible return on that investment so that they're all operating to the top of that scope. Uh, but as I say, particularly when we're, we're struggling to, to have people get the health care they need, when they need it, where they need it. Uh, and part of, the, part of the reason for that is we're just not utilising all of our healthcare professionals to the fullest of their abilities. And, and that is something that's some work that Nicola started, particularly in the area of nurse practitioners when she was the Minister for Labor. I think that is... That is really unfinished business. It's not easy, uh, those, these discussions, but, but um, better utilisation of our healthcare professional workforce, I think, is something that Labor would want to uh, come back to, frankly, if we win the next election. All right. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you all for um, those really thoughtful and broad-ranging questions, which I think really show... Um, how passionate you all are about um, our health system and how much you realise um, we need a strong health system going forward. I think also um, what I've certainly taken from tonight is the depth and breadth of Mark's thinking around this and clearly how that's playing into um, what is a, a core labour value that we have a health system that works for all of us and how Mark's going to be driving that forward as we head to the next election. So, Mark, I really do appreciate you joining us tonight. As I said earlier and as Mark said, if you have follow-up questions, please email them through. Um, and as you know, I'm always here um, to talk to you outside of these forums as well. So thanks for joining us and Mark, big thank you to you. Thanks everyone. Have a lovely night.